Hi guys, Squirrel here. Welcome to another episode of Trucking Diaries. Trucking Diaries, yes. It is 8.20 a.m. in the game, and we're about to take a job. Now, I was looking for... I was looking through the freight market, uh, because we're currently in Graz, and pretty much the only thing that I could find... Uh, when I looked in the job market, the only the only jobs that I could find were going to go northeast, and that's not good for us because we have a bunch of these already discovered. We actually want to go southwest, ideally, down to Italy is where I'd like to go. But no jobs actually generate go down here. This is the best I can get, which is to go to Nuremberg, which is northwest, and then maybe afterwards we can head this way. It's one of the things I've I've said about the job engine before. Like it doesn't take into a, it doesn't check itself when it generates jobs. It doesn't generate enough. Because it should it should always check that it's got a variety of like cargo types, weights, uh, the particular kinds of trailer, and also the direction the trailers are going in. So that there's always something going in the direction you want to go. Because if you play the game like me, where you want to head off in a particular direction, you don't want to be restricted like this. But it is what it is. Uh, we're going to take some pump equipment. Jump inside the truck. Parking brake is off. And we should... Head on over to our trailer, which I assume is this one. DNS Logistics. It's not going to be the forklift trailer, that's for sure. There we go, there's an X underneath. It's that one. Let's get ourselves lined up here. Just a li little bit off there. Should be slightly over in that direction, I think. There we go. Right, let's hook that up. And uh, we'll just check the map to see what the routing is. I don't think there's any discoverable on the way. I'm not going to pop off to Linz, I don't think. So, yeah, straight into Nuremberg. That's what we're going to go for. It's always a bit tricky to get going, this underpowered engine. One day we shall reap the benefits of having a bigger engine. Or a, even a built-in sat-nav, that would be nice, wouldn't it? A built-in sat-nav. Such luxury. Although in this day and age you could just pull out your phone, couldn't you? And stick it on the windscreen and uh, get Google Maps. <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons why vehicles are, you know... actually. I saw a trend where some of the vehicles were, were not coming with GPS systems anymore, making them optional extras. And then you kind of see the, the trend for glass cockpits now, where they've got you know, the speedo and the um, like the RPM gauge and the speedo and everything else is just completely a virtual screen now. So you can move it around and change it and customise it. And also built into that is always a sat-nav. So I, don't, I think they've stopped being options because they can just stick them inside the, uh, inside the display. Anyway, so, um, what was I going to say? Yes, I've, I've kind of got a mini-announcement, but I'm not going to do it in this video, which I know is going to be a massive tease. Um, but I'm about to go away on holiday for a couple of weeks, and I don't really want to chuck this announcement inside of a Trucking Diaries video. I want to make it announcements on its own right, if you like. So I will do that when I get back, but it is one of the... probably one of the coolest things that's happened... Um, since I've been doing this. It's such a cool opportunity that's come my way now uh, to do with this channel, to do with YouTube, in fact. And, and I can't wait to get started on it. And I shall talk more about it in, in a future video. So, speaking of the, the holiday I'm going on, uh, it is to Orlando and Florida. I'll be there for a couple of weeks. And it's probably going to be hot and humid, but I need a break. And also the Flight Sim Expo is on while I'm there. So if you're, going, if you're in Florida or can get over to Florida on the weekend of the, what is it, 7th and 8th or 8th and 9th of June, that weekend anyway, uh, you want to pop in. There's still tickets available to the Flight Sim Expo, uh, fsexpo.com, I think it is. More than welcome to come along, say hi. If not, there's another Flight Sim thing in October down at RAF Cosford in the UK. That's another one you can come to. That's in the first weekend of October, I think it is. You want to stick the date in your diary. And um, so, yeah. 
Now, I just recently came back from Truckfest Peterborough, and I don't know if you saw the SCS blog or not, but it looks like they broke one of the full motion rigs somehow. I'm not really sure what happened, but I think on the second day, somebody was... Oh, that was it. On the second day, somebody was on the on the full motion rig. They have two full motion rigs for Euro Truck, I think it was. And somebody was somebody decided to load in like a really bumpy off-road map, which of course the full motion rig diligently recreated all of its bumps and the sheer forces of, of the pneumatics. Oh boy, that guy just drove straight into me. Did you see that? He literally just drove straight into the back at full speed. Luckily it didn't damage the trailer, that could have cost that could have cost us dearly. Blimey. That was so weird. Um what was I saying? Yeah. So the full motion rig duly sort of recreated the bumps in this off-road track. And it shattered some some piece of the upright, I think. Either on the trailer or on the rig. It, it broke something significant. And now the full motion rig is out of action. And so they can get it repaired, so <laughs> not good, eh? But I was actually I was actually thinking to myself, and, and this is a question for you as well, I think. If you could have a full motion rig, would you have one? And it may sound like a stupid question, like, duh, yeah, of course I'd have one. Why would you not have a full motion rig? But then I was thinking to myself about the, the SCS one. And I don't know if you've seen it or not, but basically it's a platform. That you, it's a seat, obviously. You sit in the seat, and then in front of you are triple screens. And the, the rig has the ability to... The screen and the seat are attached together, so... The rig can tilt forward, it can tilt backwards, and it can rock you from side to side, if you like. So it can simulate, you know, if you press the brake, it will tilt forward like that, so you feel the effect of braking. Uh, if you accelerate, it'll, it'll sort of push you back, so you can feel the effect of being accelerated. Basically, it's relying on gravity. It's trying to sort of make gravity act on your body so it, it feels like you're turning. So if you sort of go around a corner to the right, um, it will try and sort of rock you left so that you, you can kind of feel that force going the other way, if that makes sense. Anyway, what, what I was thinking about, because I, I went on this thing. I've been on it a few times, actually, uh, over the last few years, I think, since they got it, certainly. And I kind of find that it's a little bit... It's a little bit odd in the experience, and I'll tell you why. I don't know if you remember a video that I made. I made a few videos, I think, a couple of years ago, when I went to Barcelona in Spain. I went to Virtual Fly's headquarters, and while I was in the Virtual Fly headquarters, I had a go at some of the full motion sims. Um, there was one that me and Jeff Faviano sat in. We did like a, a dual cockpit thing. Come on. We did like a dual cockpit thing. And that was one that had, if I remember, it had five screens, or perhaps three or five screens, something like that, in front of you. But, oh boy, this guy's going to cut me right up. I'm going to move. Because you're not going to move, and I don't want damage. Can't afford it. Aggressive AI today, eh? Flipping heck. I've been rammed, shoved out the way. What is going on? Undertaken? What next? Gonna drop a banana, no doubt. Um, anyway, the one that I tried at Virtual Fly, similar thing, full motion rig, uh, except you'll kind of sit inside a inside of a shroud, so you can't. The only things that you can see in front of you are the cockpit or the screens. You can look, you can turn round and see the real world, as it were. But as long as you don't turn round, your entire vision is taken up by the cockpit or the screens. So when this thing kind of moves around, and admittedly, I don't think the, the fo I don't think the motion was quite as good as SCS's. I don't think it can sort of move you around quite as much. Um, but you did feel the effects. The best one was one I think it was called the Ovo, and it was essentially like a giant egg with an arm sticking stuck into it, like an axis arm. So this giant egg had a door on. You got inside this massive egg, and you were fully enclosed inside this space. So now when you sit inside of it and you're flying around, 
if you were if you were in this plane and you sort of tilt back, if you pull the stick back, the the pod would sort of tilt you back, and you feel the effect of gravity. So it feels like you're climbing. Similarly, if you sort of nose down, the pod will tilt down, and you'll feel the effect of gravity. And the same thing when you sort of roll left and roll roll right. The reason that works is because your your brain is being tricked. It can feel the effects of what's going on, but it can't see what's really happening. In other words, because it can't see outside the real world, it can't see that you're just being tilted or pushed backwards. All it can see is what's in front of it on the screen, which is saying, hey, look, you're, you're climbing or you're, you're turning to the left or right. And that's why it works. The problem with the SCS one is that doesn't happen because you're sat on this seat with three screens in front of you and your peripheral, peripheral vision can completely see the real world. So your brain is not tricked properly when you're, when you're tilted back or you push forward or roll left. Your, your mind is, uh, is completely aware of the fact that although in front of you is this screen saying, hey look, you're, you're braking and this thing's tilting you forward to stimulate braking, your mind can say, hang on a minute, I can see the real world here, and all that's happening is I'm being, t I'm being tilted forward. <laughs> so you don't get the full kind of immersive effect. What the heck? Dude, come on! He's literally running the side of the trailer. Oh my god. That's like... Two times I've been rammed and once cut up by this guy in front of me here. And I've got a feeling the guy who just rammed me was the same guy who rammed me back there. This is nuts. I'm getting away with it. There's no damage, but this is... This is actually ridiculous. That's him, isn't it? Volkswagen Passat, is it? Utterly crazy. So yeah, I was thinking to myself about the VR stuff. Like if I if I had one, if 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 I, let's face it, there's two things that normally stop you buying a full motion rig like that. One, cost, and two, space. You need a lot of money, and you need a big space to put it in. And if one doesn't get you, the other one will. Usually, for most people, I do know people who have full motion rigs, like in the basement of their house and that kind of thing. They're very fortunate; they can afford it, and they've got the space for it great good luck to them if i was to get a full motion rig i'm thinking the best thing you can do is not to have triple screens in front of you but to put a vr headset on now if you put a vr headset on you've done exactly what the ovo did the flight sim egg you've taken away all the peripheral vision of the real world that's the reason that vr works is because when you put it over your head your eyes are being given one image on the left and one image on the right and your mind can't see anything else except the virtual world in front of it. It can't see the real world anymore. That's the reason why your brain is tricked. So if I had a full motion rig like SCS is, I think what they would better be doing is giving people a VR headset to put on. You would very much get a real experience then. They could still have the screens in front of them, although the driver wouldn't be able to see it because they'd have a headset on. But everybody else could see, still see what they're doing. But from the driver's perspective, they're in a virtual world and they're feeling the full effects of the forces of the motion rig. Now this obviously wouldn't work terribly well for a, a number of people because a number of people get VR sick. Uh, they put on a VR headset and they start getting motion sickness. You're never going to get around that. Even some people probably go on that motion platform and get sick, I imagine. But most people should be okay. If you put a VR headset into the mix, yep, people are going to start feeling a bit queasy, or more people will feel queasy. That's a fact of life. I mean, I had a friend that um, years ago we used to play Doom and Quake and that kind of thing. He couldn't play for more than about 30 minutes. If he played a first-person shooter game, for about 30 minutes, he'd take his glasses off, he'd rub his eyes, and he'd be like, I feel sick. And I couldn't understand it. Like, what he was getting was what we now call motion sickness in VR. He was getting it in non-VR. 
just in an FPS game, I felt really sorry for him. And I thought to myself, you know, if that was me, I would just keep on playing. Like, I, I keep playing that game until my body and my brain just gave up and just went, okay, you can play these games now. Because I, I kind of see it a bit like uh, seasickness, yeah? With seasickness, they say, like mariners say, that it takes, I think, two weeks to get your sea legs, as they call it. What that means is, a lot of them started out on a, on a boat just feeling, just thrown up over the side of the boat or into a bucket or whatever. And after about two weeks of just relentlessly being on a boat, they got the sea legs. In other words, they didn't feel sick anymore. They could just deal with it. Probably the most horrendous two weeks of their entire lives, but they got the sea legs. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if I was my friend, I would just keep playing it and hope that after a few weeks, your brain would just deal with it. Same with VR, I do wonder, I do wonder if it's something that you can get used to, if it's something that your brain can adjust to in the same way that it can adjust to seasickness. And after a while, it just kind of deals with it. I always remember when I started commuting on a train when I was a lot younger, and I was commuting from, I think, uh, Coventry down to London, it was like a two hour trip, two hours back. And the first few weeks of doing that, quite literally the first two weeks of doing that, I felt sick. And sometimes you'd sit down on the train and you'd have to go backwards. Um, same when you got in the tubes, you'd have to stand up sometimes. Sometimes you'd be going backwards, sideways. Sometimes it would be hot. You know, it was nasty at times in summer. It was pretty gruesome. And eventually, my body got used to it. I, I remember at the end of the first week, I was so tired because of all the kind of nausea and it just took take all your energy. I remember at the end of the first week I would just fall asleep, I'd get on the train and after 15 minutes I'd be flat out. And after that I could then read a book while the train was moving, watch movies while the train was moving and now they don't affect me. I kind of wonder if VR is a bit like that, the more you do it the more you kind of get used to it. I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting problem. Uh, I think VR is is here to stay. The problem with VR right now um, is the resolution. I think. But having having said that, the next generation stuff is coming along with a higher resolution, and now you've got these like RTX cards, from Nvidia. There's no reason why they don't have the grunts to play games in VR at like. 120 FPS. I mean, this game in VR could probably do 120 FPS no problem if you had the right card. Which is amazing, really, because you've got 120 frames in one eye and 120 frames in the other. But I think it could do it. If you were to play something like P3D or FSX, I, I wouldn't recommend playing that in VR. For the simple reason that, you know, there are a few things that can make you feel sick in VR. One of them is frame rate. Um, if your frame rate is inconsistent or drops too low, you'll start to get that kind of lag and that latency will definitely make you sick. Like, there's no doubt about it. And if your frame rate drops around to 24 FPS coming into an airfield in P3D and then it sort of micro stutters, you're almost certainly going to start feeling a bit weird. So, but this kind of game can certainly handle it. Um, and things like Aerofly FS2 were built for VR. They can do like 120 FPS around Innsbruck, so you know if you want to try VR flying, Aerofly FS2 is a, it's pretty decent for that. The only downside with it is there's not many aircraft and sceneries available for it. It's a cracking engine, but it's got a long way to go in terms of developer support. But another reason why people don't really get into VR is because they don't have the space for it. Like with the the Vive with the room tracking stuff, you know, you'd have to have one sensor in one corner of a room, another sensor in another corner of a room, then you need at least two by two meters of space. Like, a lot of people just don't have that. So then along comes the Rift and says, well, with us, you just have these two little tabletop sensors, and you need to put them, like, five feet apart or something, and it'll be fine. And that's a lot more convenient. But again, if you want to do room VR, you need to have the room for it. For people like me and you, what we're doing this kind of thing, trucking, we're sat down in a chair. We don't need room VR. I mean, sure, it's nice, but you can easily just sit down and do VR in a cockpit. 
And in a cockpit, it lends itself perfectly to VR, doesn't it? Think about it. Because you've got you've got this space in here that doesn't move around. Like, even if, if I'm in a plane or something and the plane's getting buffeted and I'm in VR, I'm going to start feeling a bit queasy. But if I'm in a plane, because of its cockpit, it helps my brain to deal with it because it has something solid around it that it can kind of lock onto when all the world outside is bouncing around. I mean, let's face it, if that happens in real life, you're probably going to feel sick, so it's not a complete solution. Um, it's a fact of life that when you get thrown around in a plane and stuff, you're going to start feeling a bit queasy. But in a, in, a, in a bus or in a truck or in a car or anything like that, VR is perfect in a cockpit because it gives you that stable environment inside the virtual world. I remember playing a game um, years ago on VR. I think it was at Gamescom I tried it and you was in a dungeon and you could move around this kind of dungeon with orcs and stuff around you and there was a bit where you sort of move over a ledge and you could drop and fall into a bunch of lava and the reason, like I started to feel a bit queasy and the reason I, I worked out is because while you were in this VR world you had your hand on the WASD keys on your keyboard and you could move your character around yeah, so if you started running around in VR by holding shift and W to sprint forward, you start doing that and your brain very quickly starts to feel a bit sick. And the reason it feels sick is because of the disconnection between what it's seeing and what it's feeling. Yeah, it feels your body and, and your inner ear sensors are not being pushed around. It has no sensation of movement and yet what it can see is you running around. And that's where it starts to get disconnected and that's where the queasiness comes from. So don't, you know, if you are sensitive to VR stuff, do not play first person kind of games like that. It, honestly, when you start to move in the virtual world, you'll start to feel ill, trust me. However, were you playing this kind of game where you're sat still, your player character is never moving around the world, you're just kind of casually looking around, this works a lot better. Now, bringing me back to the whole VR in your room kind of thing, I think the new Rift S, I think it's called, the Rift S, the new one, doesn't require sensors anymore. So you don't need to have these sensors on your desk. It means that even if you've just got a small bedroom and you've got your PC and your steering wheel and your desk, all you need is that headset. Just put that headset on and you're in VR. No sensors required. So you don't have to find extra space or a wall mount them or anything like that. There's no sensors, which is fantastic. And I think the Rift S might have a higher resolution than the Rift. I'm not sure about that one, but it definitely doesn't need sensors, which is a fantastic requirement, to be honest with you. Um, so definitely have a look at that if you're thinking about VR. I think Steam has also got a new one coming out, which may not have sensors either. I'm, I'm not sure about that. And I don't know what Vive are doing. But yeah, I mean, I, I digress. I don't even know how we got on this subject. But, <laughs> but in terms of the VR space, um, it's definitely coming along nicely. I think the resolution is the next thing. When I put a VR headset on, I'm always kind of slightly disappointed by the pixelation that I can see. It kind of reminds me of when I was a kid and I used to put my face right up against uh, one of those old cathode TVs and you could see all the dots. Like, you step back and you see this image and then you get up close and you see all these little dots and stuff on the screen. And you're like, wow. Same with, like, newspaper print, like the old newspapers. You still be able to see all the dots on the page. Well, it's the same with the VR headset like generation one headsets you put them on and you can see the dots because it's nowhere near like what you might call retina display where your eye can't make out dots anymore it has to be a certain pixel density before you cannot see the dots anymore i think it's i think it's around about 600 dpi something like that 600 dots per inch before you, before your eye can't see individual dots. The problem is, your computer is not powerful enough yet. That's really the problem, because it has to render two separate images at whatever res resolution each eyepiece is taking. 
at a given frame rate, which needs to be high enough and stable enough that you don't get ill. <laughs> and the technology isn't there yet. That's the, that's really what what the problem is. We can't generate the, the density that's required. It's almost like generating 4K displays in each eye. That's where you need to be. It, it's a hell of a, a lot of power that's required. But it will get there, and at that point you won't. You know, at some point you won't be able to see the dots, and at some point you'll always have 120 FPS, rock solid. And at some point the headset will be so small that you will hardly even know you're wearing it. Well, that could be a few years, yeah. But VR is definitely an interesting thing, and certainly in the simulation world, it's a very interesting thing because I think VR and simulation are very much, very much tied together. And I think that's one of the reasons why American Truck and Euro Truck adopted VR a long time ago. And I think, you know, even X-Plane has VR built into it now. So, but it is fun. If you've never tried it, it does give you, like, quite a nice 3D effect. Anyway, so I think I heard a beep looking at our finances. We're now down to 33k. We was on about 40k. So it looks like the bank, those scumbags at the bank have rocked up and taken money from us. Um, so we're gonna get paid, was it, how much do we get paid for this job? 11.6. By my estimates, the bank took about 7. So we're about 4.5k in profit, assuming nobody else decides to ram us and damage the trailer, or we, we hit a red light or something like that. So 4.5k profit of us. I think our AI normally run at about 1,000 or 1,200 a day. If we can bag another job in this day, then we should be able to net about nine grand profit plus whatever the AI is doing. Yeah, it's not bad. We might be we're probably running at like 10k profit a day in total, maybe a bit more. But it does it always amazes me how hard it is at first in this game, like how much you're scratching around for cash, and if the AI does those things to you and the traffic lights hit you too much and all the rest of it, you can quite easily find yourself in poverty. But later on, once you've got a bunch of drivers working for you, it's it's just crazy how quickly the money comes in. Like you can't spend it enough. Right, 40k limit around this slip road. And as I've always said, this game has a really good early game, a mediocre mid game, and a terrible end game. Like, there's just no end game content. It's like the, the, the gameplay just gives up for the end game. He just goes, there you go, you've got millions. Don't worry about it anymore. Don't even need to drive. In fact, just go and retire. Is he going to ram me? Please don't ram me, dude. Okay, 3H it is. Can't cope with 4L. So the quandary is always when we've got some money. The quandary is always what do we do with it? What's a sensible decision? Do we pay the bank? Do we upgrade the truck? Do we try and buy another truck? And hire another driver? Like, which way do we go on this? Now, part of me just really wants to pay off that loan. Like, I look at the loan that we have, the 18% one interest, and it just, just burns me. I just want to pay it off. But equally, I'd like to have some truck upgrades. I'd like to have a bigger engine for a kickoff. But the problem is, a bigger engine isn't actually going to make us more money. Oh, no. Also, what it will do is just make life slightly easier, but it will not make us more money. In fact, it'll probably cost us more money on fuel. So then you're forced back into making the eminently sensible business decision. And the eminently sensible business decision basically says, keep your money, buy another truck. Just buy another truck. And when you buy another truck, get another driver, and they're going to make you a thousand a day. That's the sensible thing to do. Now, what we could do, 
is we could wait till we've got enough money to buy a slightly better spec truck than the one that we have. Yeah? And then give this away to an AI driver, and then we drive that. And that way, we get a bit of an upgrade, but we also get a new truck and a new driver. And that may be the way that we go on this. We're not there yet. We don't have the money yet. By the time we hand this, it will be just over 40k again. But by the time the next bank payment goes out, I'm hoping we'll be on 50k, maybe. Right, we're coming up to Nuremberg. It looks like there's one discoverable thing over there, which is probably... Oh, no, there's two. There's two, which means there's a dealer here and a recruitment agency. So we will need to go and get that. Nuremberg discovered. I kind of feel like you should get XP for this. As in... <clears throat> if you've ever played a game called The Hunter, like, in this game, there's only two things you can really discover. Well, three, like, technically. There's a city, the recruitment agency, and the truck dealer. In The Hunter, you've got other things that you can discover, right? So you walk around the wilderness, around whatever the map is, and you can discover things that have, like, little, little icons on them that says I for information. And you go over there... And in the Eurotruck world, it would be something like a statue or a monument. Like, some cities will have a big statue. And what SCS could do is put an eye next to that. You walk over to it. Or drive over to it, I should say. And you get some XP, and it'll pop up with a little message, like an information message. Like, I don't know. Could be, say, you're in London, and you draw, like, the Trafalgar Square or Big Ben or something. And it would give you a little bit of information about Big Ben. Built in, blah, 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 blah. You know, so it's like this cool thing. You can go from city to city, trying to discover all these little discoverables, get some XP, and learn something. And it's a nice little touch. I'd like that. So it also gives you a reason as well to drive to uh, other cities. Oh, I just completely oversteered that. Uh, I think we might just get away with it. There we go. Parking brake on, engine off, disconnect the trailer, get paid. Life is good. Right, pump equipment delivered from Graz to Nuremberg. Uh, we've got rank 2 long distance bonus, proficiency bonus, so yeah. I think we just leveled up. Which we did. Uh, now, long distance, I'm not going to take rank 3 because... I'm happy with jobs up to 550Ks at the moment. I don't really need anything longer than that. Uh, High-value cargo. Got a 5% bonus on high-value cargo. It might be nice to get them onto level 2. Just in time delivery, if we took that, it would increase our uh, important delivery by 3% and urgent delivery by another 5%. So that is potentially nice. Fragile cargo would give us a 5% increase on fragile stuffs. I think I might try... I might bump that up. We could have another cargo type, which would give us more job offers. Um, but right now, I'm trying to maximize our profit. And the way to do that is to try and focus out one of these things so we get a nice fat reward when we uh, hand things in. So we'll do that. So have a quick look at the bank. So yeah, we're seven days into 35, 18%, 2,800 a day. This is just oh, so nasty, but this this is a monster. This is an absolute monster, this one. But also, as we get a higher level, we should be able to take out higher loans if you feel like it. We've got two active loans right now. You can borrow 40k. So the money that we can borrow is going to go up as we pay money off. Let's have a quick look at what our drivers are doing. Uh, driver manager... So yeah, we're making 15k a day right now. They're making 1,200 and 1,500. Tina is on two pips of long distance. So we'll wait till she gets at least three and then put her on something else. Uh, Will is on one point. So yeah, we'll need to get him to three. Okay. Things are looking like they're going in the right direction. Why has it gone to this screen? The heck game. That's nuts. I also did was go into the main menu. 
And it's just, what? Just got rid of the trailer. <laughs> Utterly bizarre. Anyway, that's it from another Trucking Diaries video, guys. We're getting there slowly, but it's a, it's a long slog. We're on 45k again. So, uh, yeah. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please give me a thumbs up if you did, if you enjoyed the series. Uh, until the next one, take care, guys. Happy trucking.